Welcome to Exploring Santa Cruz, a bi-weekly program on KSQD 90.7 FM, 89.7 FM, and 89.5. I'm your host, Matilda Rand, and my guest today is Stephanie Sumarna. Stephanie is an ed tech and innovation teacher on special assignment. She was especially hired in July 2020 to support teachers with distance learning. When students and teachers returned to in-class learning, her work turned to teacher coach, supporting teachers with technology in their classroom. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you. Hi, great to be here. Stephanie, what's your background and what led you to become a coach to teachers using technology in their classroom? Okay, well, I am going into my 15th year in education. I studied communications as an undergrad at UCSD. And then I graduated and didn't know what I was going to do with myself. So I decided that I wanted to teach English abroad because that gave me the opportunity to do something that I thought was interesting, earn money to travel. And I ended up going to Taiwan and stayed for three years and just fell in love with teaching. Then I came back to the United States to make it official and get my teaching credential at University of California in Santa Cruz. Graduated in 2008, spent my first year teaching middle school. Then I moved to teaching upper elementary. And then my most recent job as a teacher was teaching third grade at Bonnie Dune Elementary School. And then in 2020, the pandemic hit. Things were really in crisis in education. And I noticed that a lot of my friends that were in the classroom, teachers, there was just a lot of looking for what we were going to do, needing help, needing support. And I found that at my own school site, I was able to offer that support. Then I saw that there was an opening at the County Office of Education and went ahead and applied for the position as a distance learning TOSA, took that job and and haven't looked back. (laughs) (laughs) Technology is not for everyone. Would you agree? I would agree, yes. I am a parent of two little people. So my son, Hank, is five. He's going to be starting kinder this year. And my daughter, Kit, is eight. She's going to be going into third grade. And so having a lot of friends that are parents of kids around the same age and also having a lot of time in the elementary classroom, I know that tech is something that needs to be sort of handled with care, right? There's a fine balance between providing opportunity for students and giving them the chance to become familiar with technology and develop their digital literacy skills and sort of overuse of technology in terms of being a babysitter. And so I think that that's really an important conversation to have. Um, I know that I try to approach technology by being an opportunity for students. You know, we're preparing our students for jobs that we don't know if they exist yet. We don't know what the future will be like. And so we really want to make sure that they have those digital skills, which they'll need once they graduate. What about the teachers? The the, the students may be a little bit more flexible, but what about the teachers? There are educators of all different ages, all different skill sets, and just like people, we all have things that we prefer and things that maybe make us feel a little uncomfortable. So I think one of the things that's really important is that teachers see someone who's there to support them and to guide them and who isn't going to just sugarcoat things. So I think one of the things that I always really try to do is to have honest conversations about technology. I think a lot of the teachers who are most hesitant are the teachers of those students that are in the younger grades. Mm. They want to make sure, just like I said, that they're sort of balancing the on-screen and off-screen time. And then other teachers who maybe didn't grow up as comfortable with technology, maybe they didn't have that when they were younger. And so providing ways to sort of connect the dots to things that they're already doing or things that they feel more comfortable with to things that they can do with technology. Would you say that we, older people, anywhere over 30, have a little bit more fixed mind of things that we're taking in and what we are willing to open ourselves up to? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm also in the bracket of over 30. But yeah, I think that that was one of the things that was really challenging when the pandemic hit is that it was 
a switch in the way that things were happening and the requirement on using technology where some of us weren't prepared, right? We'd been doing things without technology for a long time. And so that required us to sort of switch gears. And I think some people were able to do that more efficiently. In education, working with students, there's a big movement right now to talk about a growth mindset, which includes thinking about how the mind is like a muscle. Things are not easy right at the beginning. And so you have to practice and be open to having failures, having challenges and working through those in order to grow. And so I feel like one of the interesting things about being a teacher is that you get to heal a lot of the parts of yourself that are an inner child is like, I am a struggling perfectionist. And so I know for me, if I don't can't get something right away, that's really hard. But learning about growth mindset and teaching my students about growth mindset, that was really helpful in terms of thinking about adopting new things. And so being explicit when I'm working with teachers that like, it might be challenging, it might be difficult at first when implementing technology, but just push all the buttons and give it a try and we can fix whatever ends up not working. So let's go a little bit more in specific. So you were hired during the pandemic to help teachers with distance learning. What was your approach? I was hired in July of 2020 to help with distance learning, which I already felt like was too late. <laughs> the switch to distance learning happened in March of 2020. And the end of that academic year was really challenging. You might remember that there was a point in which we sort of thought it was like all going to be over in two weeks. Yeah. We were told on a Friday, like, okay, go ahead and prepare things for your students to take home for two weeks. And, and then we'll all be back and it'll be fine. And so that dragged on and on. And that summer in particular, the summer of 2020, I think was really challenging for educators because there was a lot of unknown. And there were things where teachers thought maybe that they were going to go back in person, then they weren't. So my approach in working with teachers is that I wanted them to know that they were empowered to do what they had known was good teaching all along. So I worked really hard to try to think about technology tools that built on the expertise of what I knew all the teachers in Santa Cruz were already doing as amazing educators. So I knew that teachers were always really strong in building connections at the beginning of the year. And so I tried to collect resources that showed ways to do that same thing but to do it online. So things that sort of tapped into the expertise that was already out there, but just showed a bridge between what had happened in in in-person instruction and then what was happening during distance learning. Hmm, That's an interesting approach because I'm not sure if it's true, but there were some rumors that some teachers were so anxious that they called in sick. Was there a fear in the districts that that would happen with a lot of teachers? Teachers were scared. It was totally new and they were asked to do something totally new completely overnight. And so there was a fear that they might not be able to do that. And I think a lot of teachers hold themselves to really high expectations. Mm -hmm. Like they're accountable to their students, they're accountable to their families, and they get into the work because the students and the families mean so much to them, right? They don't want to fail them. Yeah, exactly. It's really important to them because they see every day the impact of the work that they do. And I think what was really inspiring for me being on the supporting end is that I saw teachers who even privately, if they were scared or they were falling apart, Mm -hmm. they showed up for their students. They were there. They figured out ways to connect with other teachers who were doing things that worked so that they could show up for the students and the families. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. I'm a retired educator, and I could just imagine some of the teachers that I worked with that, how are they going to do this? How do they get themselves over that hurdle? And basically, it's the love for the students. Yeah that keeps them there and keeps them coming back. But I can just imagine all these sweaty palms standing in front of the computer or sitting in front of the computer and trying to engage the students. Now, what about developing engaging lessons? You told me a little bit about, you know, teachers know what they're doing. Now they need to be shown how to do it online. Mm -hmm. But did you have an approach of helping them to develop engaging lessons? Part of why I got into this job in particular is I sort of bit the bug of being excited about technology and 
its capacity to increase engagement among students prior to the pandemic. And so what I mean by that is that I had attended some conferences that were technology related and had seen in particular just different lessons or ideas or ways of integrating technology that built student engagement. And so during the pandemic, I was excited at the opportunity to share that with teachers and to make sure that teachers sort of saw the potential for using technology to engage students. But to be quite frank, I wasn't the one that had all the answers. And so I knew that the best thing to do was to pull teachers together and to give them the time and space to talk to each other and to create a space that felt safe for them to share maybe things that weren't working and then also share things that were working. So at the County Office of Education, we started what we called distance learning think tanks. Mm -hmm. Um, And they were open spaces for any teacher TK through 12 to come together during distance learning once a month. And we had what we called demo slams, if you imagine like poetry open Mm -hmm. mic night. And so any teacher who had found a tip, a trick or a tool that was working could have three minutes to take the floor of that virtual meeting and share what was working. And then they also got to sort of create a list of things that they were struggling with, which a lot of the time centered around engagement, and then work together in small groups to sort of troubleshoot and come up with ideas. Excellent. And did you find that there was a difference in the approach of creating engaging lessons depending on the subject matter? Ooh, that's a great question. I think it might be the elementary teacher and me having covered all the subjects, Mm -hmm. but we came together TK through 12 subject agnostic because I worried that if we siloed into the different content areas that we wouldn't have as big of a pool to pull ideas from. And so when we shifted the focus around being student-centered, focusing on ways to engage your students, what we discovered was that the strategies were sort of universal across the content areas. That's good to hear. Yeah. So there was a lot of opportunity for teachers, no matter what subject, no matter what age level, that they could share specific strategies and tips. And I think a lot of it was learning new tools, Uh like ed tech tools. There were a lot of platforms that offered their tools for free during the pandemic Mm. to sort of support teachers and students. And so it was like, really rapid learning, almost a backlog of like 10 years worth of developments in ed tech. It was like, oh, this tool called Flipgrid has videos that students can post or Edpuzzle allows you to make a video and have questions inside of it. So it was all these tools that had existed during the pandemic, but it was like this explosion of use during distance learning. Good. Well, let me remind people that they're listening to Exploring Santa Cruz on KSQD. My name is Matilda Rand, and my guest is Stephanie Sumarna, teacher on special assignments supporting teachers with technology in the classroom. So let's go back to what we're talking about. What about home to school communication? Did you deal with that? Well, being a parent, yes, I dealt with it on both ends. That was actually, I feel like one of the things that prompted me to feel comfortable in sort of stepping into the role to support other educators is that in the beginning in early March 2020, I sort of adopted an approach in my own third grade classroom that if we were going to get through this, the only way that we were going to do it is to have really open communication between myself and the parents. And so I created a form for students and their families to provide feedback about the lessons that I was giving. And I updated my sort of template for providing the assignments every week based on that feedback. I opened up office hours, which is very unusual, right, in elementary school, but it was something that we needed in distance learning. So it was designated times during the day where any student or parent could call me and we could talk through the assignments. Um, And I received a lot of positive feedback from the parents that were in my class that like, oh, thank you so much for your open communication. And so when I shifted into the role as supporting other teachers, that was something that I really advocated for, was making sure that teachers were flexible in their approach of how they were delivering assignments 
and that we knew student feedback was important before, right? We had surveys that we would give maybe at the beginning of the year, maybe at the end of a term and maybe at the end of the year. But now it was like, we have to be doing this all the time because things are changing so Mm -hmm. much that we need to make sure that the new things that we're developing, we're getting feedback from the students and their families. We talked a little bit about the collaboration among teachers. I must say that's that's what I would call it, where you have your monthly tanks, think tanks. Think, yeah. What do you call it again? The think tanks. <laughs> the think tanks. And what was it like? At first, it felt like I just needed to hold a space for teachers to feel heard. Uh-huh. Things were really changing so quickly for everyone, right? And so it was like, One week, teachers were working on a schedule where students would be there every other day. And then it was the next week. It was like, no, that's not going to happen anymore. It's full distance learning. And so teachers, I think, were feeling a little bit jerked around Mm -hmm. by decision making, by the powers that be. And so they needed a space to say, like, this is what we need. And so we actually designed at the COE, we did teacher empathy study where we each found an educator that we knew. We had all been teachers, work with teachers, and so we all had at least two or three teachers that we had very close relationships with. And we asked those teachers if we could sit in and just sort of like live a day in their life of being a teacher and distance learning. And then we also interviewed those teachers afterward and asked, what are some of the hardest things? What are you finding is different about distance learning than in-person learning? How can we at the county office support you? And most of what they said was just give us a time and a space like regularly where we can connect with other teachers and hear what's working and what isn't working. And so it was almost a getting out of the way Mm -hmm. and sort of acting like a concierge of resources and knowing where things were and being able to point people in the right direction. And in the meantime, you did your own research and connected with people all around the country. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And so that enabled me to sort of connect to bigger nationwide networks Mm -hmm. and statewide networks and then deliver that information to teachers specific to their questions. There was a lot of drinking out of the fire hose during distance learning in terms of like resources and tools and information. And so it was almost like part of our job was stopping that excessive flow and just really giving customized support. Great. Let's take something very practical. We're talking about distance learning, which means that the students will have to have computers. Yes. So how did we get all these computers to all these students? What what happened? It's still mind boggling to me coming from a classroom teacher and like thinking of a budget where you're worried about pencils or whatever, right? A lot of local companies worked together to support and find ways to make devices more accessible. So one in particular is Digital Nest took their inventory of used computer equipment and refurbished them and made them available to any student in Santa Cruz County or family with a student at discounted rates. So that was helpful. Mm -hmm. And then there was a lot of funding made available by the state that enabled schools to be able to purchase all those devices. But then another logistical feat was, of course, getting those devices in the hands of students. And so, again, I feel like there was just so many miracles that happened during that time that were examples of everyone really coming together, thinking of the students and families first. So teachers working overtime to figure out how they could create a pickup line for students to come and pick up Chromebook devices. Mm -hmm. At Bonnie Dune School, I know that they had the bus driver was helping on a delivery route of assignment at the very beginning when we were doing packets, like delivering the packets to students. So a lot of just team effort. My friend uh, was at that time the superintendent in Live Oak. Mm -hmm. And so she told me how how very organized this was. And parents and the teachers decided that it was most important that the older students were getting the equipment first, the computers first. And they just went grade by grade by grade till they covered it all. And I said, how did you, you know, do you want want some of my money? And she said, no, 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 we got it taken care of. The parents, the community, they already have stepped forward. It's just a matter of getting the computers ordered and getting them into the hands of the kids. It was, like you said, it was just a miracle. Absolutely amazing. Now, we've heard talking about the kids were not in class, so they must have missed a lot of learning. Then the question is, 
to what extent is the technology mitigating what we call the mislearning? I think a lot of tech tools try to promote themselves as a way to mitigate the missed learning. There's a huge market right now for tools that utilize artificial intelligence and other technology to provide personal support to students. If any families out there are familiar with using Khan Academy, Khan Academy is coming up with a new virtual tutor called Conmigo, which is like a little personalized tutor that exists at the same time as your Khan, your student goes through Khan Academy and they provide personalized feedback, support, help answer questions just like a human tutor would to students. So there's a lot of potential for that, but I also think like there's no substitute for the human teacher who's there, who knows their students and knows their strengths and weaknesses. But I think the developments in generative AI have made some really interesting possibilities for supporting that. Could we say then that there was kind of a different learning during that time and maybe it supported other modes of learning? My teacher friends and I talked a lot about this. There was a theme of thinking of the pandemic as a portal, as a way for thinking about how to change a lot of the things that have been so deeply rooted in education that maybe aren't serving all of our students. And so one of the things that came out of distance learning that I think was so interesting is anecdotally, teachers were noticing that while there was a considerable amount of students that struggled to really connect through the computer or to make that quick switch into getting content in a different way, showing their understanding in a different way, there were students that thrived. So students that hadn't previously really thought of independent study as a course, but it was almost like being able to see things delivered in a different way where they could, a lot of teachers went to sort of laying out their units as modules where students could be a little bit more Mm self-paced. I know at least in my own class, I saw a lot of students that worked ahead, like students that I would have never thought in the classroom space, that would have been something that they could have done. And so thinking differently about how Hmm, when we do go back to in-person learning, like how are we going to sort of carry those lessons forward? Like I said, my daughter Kit is eight. During the pandemic, she had her first full year of kindergarten was that big year of distance learning. And her teacher was really great about offering choices. If there was a skill that they were working on sort of providing different opportunities for her to practice that skill. Mm -hmm. And then coming back to in-person, kindergarten is your first year, like really in school. And that was remote learning was then her mindset of like, that's how school could be, right? And so she returns to in-person and she's like, where's my menus? Or why aren't I able to work ahead? Or why can't I choose what I'm doing at this time to practice this skill? And so for me, that was so cool (laughs) and interesting. I like engaged in some really deep conversations with my daughter around what the purpose of education is and how to sort of best meet the needs of your students. Wonderful. If people want to contact you, they can email you at ssumarna. I'm going to spell it out. S-S-U-M-N-A. A-R-N-A at Santa Cruz, C-O-E dot O-R-G. So it's S-Sumarna at Santa Cruz, C-O-E dot O-R-G. And it's all one word, except for a dot before O-R-G. Now, uh, educators, if you're listening, all Stephanie's resources are on her website. It's outside the box dot Santa Cruz COE dot ORG. Again, outside the box dot Santa Cruz COE dot ORG. And that's for professional learning that you do, and all of your resources are on that website. Yeah, that's right. So you can look at it to get a list of my upcoming workshops, but there's also resources that you can access that don't require coming to a workshop. Not only are you helping teachers with technology and innovation in their classrooms, on May 6th next year, you're going to be heavily involved with the Teacher Appreciation Week, and I understand why you do that. So tell us a little bit about that. We have a minute to do that. 
that's my pet project that has nothing to do with technology, although I did infuse some technology flair into it. We use the magic of Google Forms to open up teacher appreciation nominations to our community. So any student, any parent, any community member that has an educator in their life that they would like to appreciate, you can go to our Santa Cruz COE website, santacruzcoe.org in May, and we open up this Google form. You can submit your appreciation, and then we will generate a certificate and email it to that teacher. Last year, we had over 800 nominations, and I greedily send them out from my email account because I just, it's like a whole week of happiness where we're just sharing appreciation for all the hard work that the educators in our county do. And you're coming back to k Squid to talk more about it, to start off the week actually on May 6th with us. Uh, I'm very excited to do that. Any final thoughts, half a minute? I think my final thoughts are just, I'm really excited about the possibilities. I just want to reiterate again the power of all of the educators coming together to work together. And so just an appreciation for all the things that our teachers do. And I'm sure they appreciate you. We have been listening to Exploring Santa Cruz with Stephanie Sumarna. And in a few days, this conversation will be on our website, kscudi.org. Give me a few days to edit it, and then it will be on there.